I welcome you all to the inauguration ceremony of the India Study Centre. Before we proceed further, I would like to invite Kali Saha to recite a few verses from the Holy Quran. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنا أعطيناك الكوثر فصل لربك وانحر إن شانيك هو الأبتر صدق الله العظيم Ladies and gentlemen, our chief guest for today's event is Air Chief Marshal Suri Laman Hishani Siyad, former Chief of Air Staff. He's a graduate of Karachi University and King's College London. He's also a proud alumnus of Royal College of Defence Studies, United Kingdom, and has attended national and international security course at Harvard Kennedy School, USA. Air Chief Marshal Suri Laman has a rich staff experience and has served in all key positions. In recognition of his exceptionally meritorious services, he has been awarded Nishana MCR. Our second speaker, Mr. Zahid Hussein Shorty, is the Director General of South Asia at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We are also joined today by Dr. Muhammad Najib Afsar, Associate Professor of School of Politics and International Relations, Kanyatin University. He has authored a book titled Bharatiya Janata Party and the Indian Muslim. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I now request the Director, India Study Centre, Dr. Sir Malik, Tamkai Nzia, to say a few words regarding the centre. <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Honorable Air Chief Marshal Suhail Aman, Nishane Mithya, former Chief of Air Staff, respected Ambassador Khalid Mahmood, Chairman Board of Governors, Institute of Strategic Studies, worthy Ambassador Aziz Ahmed Chaudhary, Director General Inter Institute of Strategic Studies, distinguished guests, dignitaries, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum and very good morning. <coughs> At the outset, I, on behalf of India Study Center in team, welcome you all to the inaugural ceremony of this center, the first ever research-based initiative underlining exclusively India and Indian policy specifically affecting Pakistan. I am grateful to the worthy chief guest for taking his time out for extremely, extremely busy schedule for his gracious presence this morning. Let me express my profound gratitude to the Director General for conceding the intense deliberative exercise hosting the conventional adversary. It is indeed a great moment for me as a founding director to occupy the podium and outline the futuristic visualization of the objective behind setting up this research journal. Ladies and gentlemen, Pakistan, Pakistan cannot stay oblivious of the odds happening in across the border, especially in the context of lethal atrocities meted out to the Kashmiris, coupled with latest developments in the context of Indian Muslims. It would be a matter of thorough cognizance that the present-day developments in India need thematic sessions to spread out policy options for Pakistan vis-a-vis persuading international community to set aside their negligence towards Indian wrongdoing to the minority Muslims in Pakistan. There is no gainsaying the fact that many of the foreign and security policy challenges for Pakistan emanate from India, necessitating in-depth study and analysis, thus strategizing appropriate response. With profound geopolitical changes occurring across the landscape of Asia, India is assuming an ambitious and hegemonic agenda in the region. Internally, India is going through a phase of rising Hindu nationalism with deeply concern for its marginalized community. Lately, there has been a sudden rise in human rights violations and acts of violent extremism in India. 
BJP is seen actively promoting the Hindutva ideology and further downgrading the minority, especially Muslim. Its recent emergence as a post secular polity in the aftermath of acts of 5th August and 11 December 2019, respectively, has put a big question mark on the future of Muslims in India. With the rising concerns over growing nationalism in India and its desire to become a regional hegemon by expanding its military might and economic role in South Asia, the Indian Ocean, and beyond, there is an urgent need to have a futuristic assessment of Indian ambitions. Hence, the Institute of Strategic Studies has taken this lead of establishing the first India Center, India Studies Center in Pakistan. The aim of India Studies Center, commonly known as ISC, is to conduct focused research and analytical study on multi-dimensional aspects of India and promote policy discourse on India's foreign security and socio-economic policies, along with implication Pakistan and the region as well as well, India-Pakistan relations. When we talk about Pakistan-India relation, Kashmir cannot be ignored. Therefore, the center will focus on Kashmir because monitoring developments related to India's regional and global policies, contribution to the existing body of knowledge through evidence-based research by maintaining data bank on multi facets of India will be a significant support. In order to generate better understanding of the issues concerned, Meaningful events will be organized for the policy discourse. Provision of policy input to the relevant stakeholders will also be the hallmark of this as this ends in generating an informed debate on issues concerning India. Ladies and gentlemen, I conclude with this famous quote by the Sanzu, which he has mentioned in his popular book, The, Four, the Art of War. I quote, if you know the enemy, and know yourself, you need not fear the result of 100 battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy, nor yourself, you will come in every battle. I am unquote. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience today. I would now request Chief Guest Air Chief Marshal Kuvayla Man and Director General of Student Strategic Studies in Islamabad, Ambassador Ezaz Ahmed Chaudhary, to unveil the plaque. Thank you. And Chairman of Ladies and gentlemen, I now request the Director General of Ayat Sasai, Ambassador Ezaz Ahmed Chaudhary, for his closing remarks. Thank you. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. What an honor it is to welcome Air Chief Marshal Sahil Khaman uh, to the inauguration of one of the most important happening in the Institute of Strategic Studies. So Hail Aman is a thorough professional um, with a very strong intellectual prowess. Uh, he has demonstrated in his long career in Pakistan Air Force that he was a high achiever and a commander with a strong commitment to the service of the nation. And above all, he has been, he's been so passionate in all that he ever does. I share the privilege of having served with Suhail Aman in the same squadron, I have been squadron, EPA for the Sarvoda for over three years together. And that is totally my own privilege and the privilege I can cherish. He is also a very fine human being, an amiable personality. Uh, so uh, the, the, the role that he has played in uplifting the role of Pakistan in the defense of the nation 
with before everyone. In fact, we were just talking in my room about the role that Pakistan Air Force played in survey us, which uh, indeed uh, was commendable. The way Pakistan Army, Pakistan Air Force, uh, and uh, civilian authorities gel together, and that harmony uh, ensured that today terrorism is on the retreat in Pakistan. All advisories are being changed. And inshallah, we have a bright future. So, thank you very much, Chair Chief Marshal, for your contribution to the nation. So, let me say a few words about the vision which is guiding us here at the Institute of Security Studies. Studies. You all know that this institute has been in existence since 1973. We do basically three things we research. Uh, on issues of importance and relevance to Pakistan. We also carry out events to further our narrative. And then we also provide policy inputs to our stakeholders, primarily Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is our funder, which funds our entire programs. The focus that we are trying to bring to the Institute is um, with regard to three aspects. One is we want to build up the quality, enhance the quality of what we research on. Uh, there are several ways of doing that. One is to improve the research methodology, the other is to ensure there's no plagiarism. But one way which is most important is that whatever we research on is widely read everywhere. For that, we have enlisted our institute with over seven indexing agencies in the United States and rest of the world. So now our articles are read and cited uh, in the US and we get a feedback on that. So we are very pleased with that one year effort that we have made on improving the quality of our, you know, our work and our reach out. The other is synergy. Because we get our themes mostly from Ministry of Foreign Affairs and other stakeholders, whatever we research on, we also want to make sure that the events that we organize, the roundtables, the conferences, the international events, those should be more or less on the similar themes so that we, whatever we research on is then manifested in the, in the policy discourse and whatever we discuss in those events is then reflected into our, into our research, so giving us this energy. The third element of our focus is, is narrative building. Actually, we are living in the age of narratives. Honestly, if you tell me that this is black and if you constantly say this is white, many people will tend to believe that this is white. We don't want to say what is not correct, but we do want to clear misperceptions about Pakistan. And I think we, the institute, which is connected overtly with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, has this responsibility to magnify the national narratives. Uh, and we all, I'm, I'm sure you all share with me that our image is worse than our reality. So we need to really work on that, and this institute is totally committed uh, to that as well. So what do we do? What's our methodology? Uh, our, we have a, our own building. We have uh, about 24, uh, 25 research team. Uh, so we thought that we are already endowed with enough resources. We don't need more. So what we can do is that we can achieve more with less. So we came up with the concepts of establishing centers of excellence within the institute from within existing resources. It's not that we we are uh, proliferating or we are expanding. No, it's the it, that we are setting up centers. We have a functioning China Study Center, China Pakistan Study Center, which is flourishing, I must say, and uh, it is it has engaged in programs. We just to give you one example that we were able to bring together. Uh, 16 China study centers operating all over Pakistan here twice and 10 Pakistan study centers in all across China here. So we were able to bring 20 lead, you know, professors of 20 leading universities from China and then, you know, make them sit with the professors from Pakistan. So this is, uh, this is what we are doing in China study center, which as you know, is our uh, most important strategic and economic partner. The other one that we have recently created is ACDC, Arms Control and Disarmament Center. Uh, again, uh, who can disagree that uh, for Pakistan, nuclear capability, this, this uh, 
nuclear deterrence that we have developed uh, is the ultimate equalizer to the conventional asymmetry we have uh, with India. Uh, why with India? Because India is the only country from which we have suffered aggression uh, uh, at least four times. And therefore, it was extremely important. Every Pakistani actually feels honored and pleased that we have a nuclear capability which is defensive in nature. It's not offensive. It's defensive in nature. And we want to make sure that we must deter any future possible aggression against Pakistan. So this, uh, we thought that this is to, which already was working on disarmament uh, themes must also play its part. So ACDC, which has a very vast advisory board, is working closely with SPD and the, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Disarmament Division is now uh, in full swing. In fact, one of the first events we are organizing is on emerging technologies and its impact on strategic stability. Uh, we're doing it in two parts. One on one impact of uh, emerging technologies on uh, strategic stability. The other is uh, uh, militarization of outer space. So that we'll do next next month. This one is uh, is, is scheduled for this month. So that is the second mm, uh, center. The third center that we are inaugurating today uh, is uh, India Study Center. Why India Center and why not South Asia Study Center? Now, for as long as I can remember, all over Pakistan, the area study centers focused on South Asia. And not that South Asia is not important, not that all the smaller, relatively smaller nations are not import important. There was a philosophy, because, all, and I have particularly seen it myself in the SARC meetings, that these relatively smaller nations would band together to counterbalance. India, not in a negative way, but in a positive sense, so that the big country would not become hegemonic in imposing its decisions. So we, 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 uh, there, there was a perfect good rationale for that. But I thought that in the process we weren't really focusing enough on on India. If you go to Jawaharlal Nehru University, you will find many more PhDs on Pakistan alone than you would find in in Pakistan doing PhDs on India. So we, so it, it, I think there is enough. Um, to study on, uh, uh, as Director Saf was saying, uh, quoting the Chinese uh, uh, historian, and, uh, and, and that that we need to know them. We need to know them, and we need to know all those aspects. So we are pleased that this is happening. We will be creating another center later on. Uh, um, the Foreign Minister, Honorable Foreign Minister, has asked me to create a center on Africa and Middle East. We will be doing that uh, later on. Uh, we don't want to move too fast, we want to consolidate what we have done. But let me also tell you what we are doing is that two, three researchers, four researchers, five researchers for each center doesn't mean that they carry all the burden. The burden is carried by the institute in entirety. So if an event happens in one institute, in one center, everybody comes along. The whole, whole institute comes to life to, to support that. So we think that we will be able to uh, organize our efforts in a manner that we can produce focused research and uh, in-depth studies as well as organize this course which is connecting so many other independent uh, disciplines. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Sahas has already explained that we in this and you already have a leaflet on place on every uh, every table you describes the functions. We want to monitor the developments uh, in India. Uh, in every domain, political, economic, strategic, in every domain. And then we want to uh, carry out studies on, on issues and uh, themes of importance. We want to conduct discourse on those very themes to enrich our uh, knowledge base and then build a data bank. We have always felt, in fact, the, uh, the foreign secretary told me, it was his idea that we must have the center, he told me that we need a data bank. A data bank on every facet of India's activity so that if we need to refer, we should be able to know where to find it. Uh, and of course, finally, to provide policy inputs. All this must get somewhere. And you know, the, the, the biggest challenge today is to, and, and it's not only Pakistan, it's everywhere, is to find the right link between uh, what we research on and, and, uh, and the policy making circles. And that, that link is, in fact, uh, this famous book, um, uh, you know, cult of the irrelevance. Uh, we are organizing.
organizing actually a seminar in March uh, mm, uh, on the uh, role of research in policy making because we think that we need to find that bridge especially in academia people do a lot of research and they say that nobody really wants to know what, what we have done so we think that we need that bridge uh, between policy making and when you talk to policy makers and I have also been part of that for 37 years I know that we just didn't have time we just didn't have time nobody has time to, to read long papers and therefore it was important that we find that bridge so we will be doing that the broad themes that we will be studying on Dr. Savas spread out some of them of course Kashmir which remains as the core issue for the foreign policy challenges of Pakistan uh, homegrown extremism and terrorism in India is another theme uh, minorities and demographic trends in India uh, dynamics of key states within India uh, India as you know is not a federation it's a kind of union of independent states so we need to know uh, what different states are thinking the military machine that India has built as you know this center in fact we are doing this Tuesday dialogue on uh, India's march towards military modernization so we need to really understand uh, you know, what all India is doing and we will be focusing on that. Economy of India, of course, and a lot of budget has done. They were projected as, as, as on top of the sky, but actually it turns out that it was not so. And then, of course, foreign policy of India, especially its relations with major countries and with its neighbors. So I think the, the, this is not an exhaustive list. So we will be creating an advisory board. The people who have been high achievers as a, either as a practitioner or as an academic um, in studying India, we would be actually forming an advisory board and taking guidance uh, from them. Um, uh, thank you so much uh, for all of you to come, and, uh, come in for this very important event. It's a very important phase for, for the Institute's life and uh, we are quite confident that we will be able to, inshallah, uh, add to the national discourse on studying and then uh, knowing truly uh, what India is and what it plans to do in the future ahead. God bless you all. God bless Pakistan. Thank you, sir. I now invite Mr. Zahir Rati Chaudhary, Director General of South Asia, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for his remarks. <coughs> Air Chief Marshal is Suhail from Hansan, <coughs> Chairman Institute of Study, Studies, Islamabad and Raja Khalil Mahmood, Director General of Bachelor Egaz Ahmed Fawzi, ladies and gentlemen. It's an absolute pleasure and an honor to be among this highly informed gathering for the launch of India Study Center here at the Institute of Strategic Studies. I can see among the audience some of the foremost experts, scholars, and senior colleagues who have worked with on India with great distinction and at some of the most critical moments in Pakistan-India relations. And many of you still continue to work on this important relationship. I therefore feel rather intimidated to speak on India in the presence of these foremost experts on India. But let me begin by complimenting the Institute of Strategic Studies for this extremely valuable and timely initiative. The center, I am sure, will become premier research center on India and a great resource for all of those who are interested in better understanding India. Ladies and gentlemen, the relationship between India and Pakistan is one of the most important but also one of the most complex and complicated ones. For the past 72 years, it has remained at the heart of our foreign policy discourse. Therefore, there has always been a need in the academic and policy circles to understand India, but this need has never been as acute as it is today. The Indian social, economic, and political landscape is undergoing a sea change under the current Indian leadership. 
the India of today is different from one known to most of us. New research is therefore needed to understand the new mindset, the new ideology, the new strategic thinking, and the new approach. We've been hearing that India is on the move. The journey is from incredible India to intolerant India, from the largest democracy to the largest theocracy, from secularism to Hindu Rashtra, all are palpable. India is indeed on the move, but this move is causing a lot of anxiety and pain in the civilized world of today. There is in fact a need to reassess the whole Indian construct and dictum. India has itself thrown its own narrative about the partition of the subcontinent and the two nation theory out of the window. Some of the key questions the research are struggling with today are, is it Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi's India or is it his assassin Nathuram Vinayak Gorse's India? Is Gandhi still the national hero of India or is it Godse? Who shot Gandhi in the chest three times from point blank distance? The new national protagonists such as Godse, they are unfortunately becoming the national heroes of a country that we have to live with. And even more importantly, is it still India or has it already become Hindustan? Ladies and gentlemen, neither the pace nor the direction of India's shift is rational. So there is no way for Pakistan or any other rational country to engage with India in a rational manner. But unfortunately, Pakistan does not have the luxury to either disengage itself from India and overlook its rapid regression. I am sure the center will also find it useful to study the Indian propaganda machine to better understand as to how the perpetrator of state terrorism has been presenting itself as the victim of terrorism. It will also be useful for the center to study as to how India has misled the international community for so long on the issue of state or non-state actors while itself using its own serving officers such as Commander Kulbhoshan Yadav for terrorist activities in other countries. The center will also find it useful to decode Hindutva mindset and study the Chanakya doctrine to understand the fascist mindset that is at the heart of RSS BJP regime. The center's research might be helpful in making the world understand as to why Indian state sponsored sexual terrorism is more dangerous than any other form of terrorism. And also, why the extremist Hindutva ideology is more dangerous than any other form of extremism known to the world. Understanding the Hindutva ideology will lay bare the Indian hegemonic designs that are not only a threat to the region, but also threatening the global peace. I am sure the center will also be able to focus on the situation in India occupied Kashmir, the illegality of Indian actions of the past five, the digital holocaust resulting from more than six months long communication blockage and media blackout, the incarceration of entire Kashmiri leadership, the illegal detentions and forced disappearances of, of over 13,000 young Kashmiris, the presence of more than 900,000 occupation troops <coughs> making Indian occupied Kashmir the largest open prison in the world, and the talk of opening de-radicalization camps in an area which is already a prison. And also the study of draconian laws such as Armed Forces Special Powers Act and Public Safety Act and how these laws 
are in contradiction with international law and international norms. The South Asia region in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs indeed looks forward to benefiting from the quality research the center will be doing on these and other important issues. Let me conclude, ladies and gentlemen, with the hope that the center will be able to establish close linkages with other academic institutions and think tanks, not only in Pakistan, but globally for joint research and mutually beneficial exchange of ideas. Ambassador Azad Ahmed Chaudhary spoke out an exhaustive list of the areas on which this newly established center will be working. But if the director general allows me to make a wish, my wish would be a request for the center to study India's incurable obsession with Pakistan and also prescribe a remedy if there is one. And thank you very much. Thank you, sir. And I will invite Dr. Muhammad Najib Akbar for his part. Thank you for making me part of uh, this uh, new venture uh, of India and India Center. When I joined academia, I discovered that academics exist at the periphery of Pakistani society. And if you are working on the domestic politics of India, you are on the periphery of the academics as well. So it's a long way to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, there generally exist two broad trends in academic life. One is an attitude of justification. We are expected to justify whatever policy the policymakers are making and following. So there exists a justificationist attitude among us. The reaction is Simply, we detach ourselves from the official processes and condemn whatever they are doing. So the alternative is condemnation. So if policy is successful, one party celebrates, and if it is a failure, we have told you. Somewhere in between these two justificationists and condemnationists processes, I think there is a lot of space to have serious academic work that can be beneficial to Pakistani state and society. And hopefully, this center will be able to do that. Secondly, there is a serious gap between the practitioners and the theorists. Practitioners think they know everything because they are handling it. And the theorists think since we know everything, for the last 1,000 years, we know better than you. Somewhere we both are wrong. Uh, we are so-called the Kitabi Kiras, and you are the actors on the ground, and we always think that you are working without any perspective. I think there has to be a linkage between the two. And whenever there has been a link on any policy, we can be able to make good policies. Just take Kashmir, we thought we had lost Kashmir, we have sold Kashmir, or can we afford a war on Kashmir? But just with a few months, we are discovering that in between, there are a lot of options that can be exercised with reference to the Kashmir issue after abrogation of Article 372, or amendment Article 372. So this combination of practitioner and the theorist will help at least the academics to come to life and experience what actually is happening in the arena of policy and policy. 
Thirdly, I would say there is a very, it's a very boring thing in academic work. You collect data, you process academically this data, make it understandable and usable knowledge. But without this boring stuff, I don't think a good paper or a good policy can be made. For a longer period of time, we have been dependent on the best to collect data, process this data, and transform it into a knowledge. So we have created not one dependency, but many dependencies because of this process. If we start to collect our own data and have a knowledge of our own, I think it will help us in a very long way. India, I always see India as a very unique country, not simply an enemy. It is an enemy, but it is a very unique as well. It is the only third world country that has a functioning democracy, functioning according to law. Even the present processes which are going through in India are taking place within this structure and transforming it there. Without understanding India in its own right, I don't think we can be able to have a correct policy towards India. We need to understand the rising nature of India correct rising nature of India and our place in comparison to India. I hope this center will be able to do this essential thing. On behalf of my School of Politics and International Relations in Paradise University, I extend all our support. Hopefully, we will be able to come up with a good research work. Thank you. Chief Guest, Air Chief Marshal Kabir Khan, for his remarks. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Honorable Chairman Viji Bhatta Azaz, Vice Chancellors, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum. What a great pleasure and uh, honestly an honor for me to be here this morning to uh, attend the inaugural of India Studies Center. Uh, well, scope has been defined by many, especially the DG. Uh, to my own mind, when I started to think about it, uh, it encompasses a lot more. It will get into the policy formulation in almost every domain, starting from economics, foreign policy, and others. But I'll talk about these a little later. Uh, first of all, my thanks um, to the chairman and the DG for having me here uh, and having spoken such uh, good words. Uh, coming out to a few of the comments of the DG and the vice chancellor, and I see a beautiful uh, construct out here. The policy makers actually do not have time. And the worst thing is they think that they know everything. And that is, what, that is what we, and that's not true for Pakistan, but that's what is true for a lot of other countries and even few of the uh, leading democracies. Uh, I think that's an important structure to be remembered because that's what is impacting the mind of India and the Hindu and all those coming up. I think that's very important to remember. Uh, there's another important quotation which needs to be understood. And that's between Jews and the Nazis relationship and Hindu and Hindu. But the basic difference that I struck out here, is, regardless of Genesis part, is that because of certain inevitable factors, United States had to put huge support out there, and that is why from nothing the Israel grows to what is grown up today. Uh, under the same state of mind. 1920s RSS. Now today the world is challenged, and I'm not talking about South Asia alone, to a mindset which thinks being a democratic 
force, they think that they can push in the Hindus or the Hindu talk as a strategy into uh, going and taking action. I think these are two very important factors. The internationals change the way they move. And what is the mindset out in India? Uh, on this center, my own, um, it will be an honor for me to come and uh, discuss few of the areas uh, which are important. Uh, the mindset India at this time is nothing to really get worried about. That's my firm belief. On the leadership panel, we used to talk about the ability of leadership is converting challenges into opportunities. And I think that's a fantastic line. I mean, we in Pakistan have been having challenges one after another. Um, terrorism, a lot of people honestly, even at this time, may not understand what was the magnitude and how our enemies collaborated together to put that challenge into us. God was very kind. There was complete synergy between not only, only the military, but the nation stood behind. Mm -hmm. And that is how we ended up defeating that challenge. And that is how there are um, time and again strategies coming up against Pakistan put us one down. But then it is the ability to convert those challenges into opportunities is what we need to understand. So India is not an issue that we should, um, in any case, get pressurized or we should get uh, even uh, even stressed about it. There are fault lines, and there are major fault lines which are there within the India in terms of separatist movements, in terms of what is happening in Kashmir, in terms of the South sector, uh, looking at the big losses on the economy. I think those are very important areas that we really need to understand and take care of. Um, the last point that I would like to make here is that for the uh, center to study, um, the term hybrid war, I have a difficulty with this term. We've been through the conventional wars, fine, but then we decided the nuclear deterrence, which was the war, and nuclear deterrence did serve a great purpose. Went to the prince of war, came back, everybody in this room, this is not right to go. And I think lately what happened, uh, India did find, try to find their space out there, but they understood that in case there's a political disconnect between your military ability and your political disconnect, you get failure on both sides. The military is unable to do a task. And I think they very quickly discovered, not only on the Air Force side, but they very quickly discovered the major flaws despite the equipment that they have on their training. And that's what is something very important to understand. Uh, so from a conventional war to a nuclear deterrence, hybrid war is not the term that a hybrid strategy is something that we may like to focus on. Because wars may not take place in that conventional domain, but then there are real time opportunities and the strategies to be put into action to make sure that the other country is taken care of in that very manner. We are peace loving country and we understand all of us very well. But then when you have an enemy next door who wants to subjugate, who wants to annex Kashmir with 370, and who wishes to dominate the region, and I think like the investor is out was saying, that small countries will pull up and be, I mean, they're economically constrained. They need that big country support, but I think for that to be harnessed, the hybrid strategy is something we need to understand very clearly. We need to understand the mindset and the ground for the hybrid strategy is absolutely prepared. That is what we need to exploit and accentuate. And I'm sure this study center will do a lot of work into the hybrid strategy and work out very fine. We belong to a very proud nation. God has been very kind to our nation. We've gone through wars, we've gone through many challenging times, but we always look at the horizon as a nation a nation of very competent people. And I'm sure the destiny of this nation lies absolutely into the sky. Thank you very much, Louis. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I now request the back to Khalid Mahmood, Chairman Ali Kassai, to present the sheet to the chief guest.
Geschichte gibt es zwei Gehirne an die Schermen eines Gefeiers, die kommt vom Wurf für ein Luftfoto vor der Frage der Kinderstellen. Thank you. 